Now, a coach is somebody who works with you, knows your limits, understand your, understands your limits, understands your constraints, understands your strengths, and finds ways to extend your strengths. In some cases, helps you overcome weaknesses. But the person is going to work with you rather than want you to work for them. And I think a boss or a manager is somebody who wants you to work for them. I am inherently exercising superiority when I say that. As a coach, I'd like to be trusted. Hi, welcome to another episode of The Angry Coach. Today, I am delighted to have Hari Krish along with me. Hari Krish is Managing Director at uh, PwC Consulting. He's had a fantastic career of 18 plus years in this organization spanning multiple geographies, including the United States, India, as well as China. I'm going to invite Hari to introduce himself in a little bit more detail because he's had such extensive work. Hari, welcome to The Angry Coach. Vivek, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Uh, I have had an 18 year journey with PwC right now, but I uh, famously say that I've had six careers in the same place. So I'm blessed and uh, thankful for the multiple careers that I've had. It's uh, 12 years in the US. I spent a lot of time with technology companies helping with their business transformation. And the last six plus years, I've been physically here in Bangalore, scaling uh, a practice that supports US businesses, what is now about 14,000. Wow. wow, big numbers there. Um, and I know we will get into each of these elements in a bit more detail. As I get started, Hari, I'm going to ask you my first question. What makes you angry? Vivek, that's a, it's a question that I think I can have a lot of conversation about. I try not to let my temper get the better of me in many cases. But if you must ask, there are two specific things. Uh, one, in situations where I have as a coach, as a coach, I have individuals that approach me without much thought about what do they really want out of that conversation. So... One conversation goes by, two conversations goes by, we haven't established what they want. So it's one of the things that gets me most angry. Uh, a second such situation is also when we as individuals and we are human beings, we work together, we coach each other, but there isn't respect for the coaching that we give. There isn't credit for the coaching we give when we were approached for coaching, when we were approached for doing certain things. I. I would like for people to credit the individual's ideas and thoughts at the minimum. Right? Um, not blowing things out of proportion, you don't need to market or anything like that, but uh, it is important to respect the time of individuals and the coaching time that they get. So these are two things that often get me frustrated, if you must ask. I think these are great things. I mean, I can completely share your uh, sense of frustration as well. The first one is when individuals come to you for guidance, mentorship, help, but they themselves aren't prepared. They haven't done their own homework. They don't know what outcome do they want to get out of it. So the conversation becomes a generic conversation, but not a specific outcome focused conversation. That is correct. Yeah, yeah, mm. I give you, if you, if you mind, I will give you an instance where I had a person coming in and uh, stating the problem. I right. understand the problem. I hear you. But I would also like for you to have thought through a few things, a, pa a few pathways or a few outcomes or like, what's going on in your mind. Right? What are you thinking? How are you processing it at the end of it? So I, gen I generally ask these questions as a coach. I ask these questions and I like to listen to them. But when it gets to second conversation, especially with middle management uh, individuals that I coach, uh, they've gone through these situations themselves, coaching people, and I'd like for them to have planned at the bare minimum, a conversation that they enter into should have had some planning. Behind. And if there is no planning behind a conversation, it, it winds up being a lot of time spent on just diagnosing the problem rather than addressing the problem. Very fair. Very fair. And Hari, I have experienced a lot of this as well in my career. So one of the things I'm curious about is 
Why do people not prepare for it? Why are they not so focused on their end outcomes? What do you think is the barrier with them? So I'm going to say there's a couple of different things. One is people tend to be very myopic and focused on reacting to things. Uh, I'd say one is the fact that as human beings, we are emotional and there's nothing wrong with that. But in a career or in a professional situation, even in a personal situation, this has helped me quite a bit. Uh, taking a moment or taking several moments or taking the night, whatever is appropriate for the situation, we must choose to respond more than react. Uh, reactions like pain to a wound, right? That's fine. But in a professional situation, we have the luxury of not having to react as often, but be more responsive. And especially for middle management individuals wanting to grow up the ladder, sandwiched in between satisfying the needs of their people that they coach or are responsible for, and the people that they are reporting up to for results for various other reasons, they have to be more responsive. They don't have to react. I think that's one big reason why individuals come through as less prepared. Uh, a second reason I've often noticed is the is the need for attention. Is uh, sometimes it's organizational cultures, but I'm going to toe the line of where an organization culture is great and is conducive for coaching. We want people uh, to be able to respond. However, these are people that are coming through and wanting and being needy. And these are not very uh, conducive or constructive conversations. So needy individuals wind up being uh, difficult to progress a conversation with. I think the thing that I have noticed when people wind up not being planned, they have the thirst to go and pour out everything that they just felt rather than being responsive. And that becomes a needy nature. My God. Very well, I think, articulated. So the first one is responded versus reacting. We are more used to reacting. And so therefore, it's very convenient for me to just walk up to my manager and react to whatever stimuli is coming my way versus having spent that time at my own desk to really see what really do I want and then I can respond in the right way. Exactly. I would completely agree with you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, if I was a professional, and I'm going to continue on this thread because I think it's such an important thread. If I was a professional, um, how may I plan as I'm approaching my manager, as I'm approaching my organization coach, for example? What are some things I should look at, questions I should ask myself, or thoughts I should have already put in so that I come across as a better professional? Yeah. So let's, let's sort of break this down into a few different ways. Uh, we go through situations as individuals, and let's say one scenario where a person is faced with a, uh, a customer and the customer is having uh, difficulty making choices. And the scenario in question might be a sales individual who is my coachee and is working with a customer and the customer is having a hard time making decisions, is constantly changing his or her mind. And in this case, uh, salespeople want to close the sale. It's, it's time. The faster they close the sale, they move on to the next sale. Got but it. the era that we live in is also customer success. It's also customer experience. It's customer delight. There's a variety of terms we can give to it. But the fundamental thing is the customer wants to be made to feel important. As well. so Very fair. When a salesperson in this situation is finding frustration that the customer is going back and forth in his or her requirement or needs and is constantly sending the signal of pushing the deal out, there is going to be a sense of frustration that the salesperson has. What can this salesperson in question, I'm going to call this a woman, a she, is going to have? She is going to have a sense of frustration not moving and she's going to say, you know what, I'm going to move on to my next sale or I'm just going to go tell my boss that this customer is being very difficult. I can't deal with this customer. Assign somebody else because I need to take care of my other customers. So what options this is? This is one way to react to it. If you call it a response, it's fine, but it's one way to react to it. Now, how do we deal with this response? If I was that salesperson, I would sit down and I'd say, okay, what is this customer going through? What is in my control? What is not in my control? I think that's the number one question some of us need to ask. There are variables in my control. And what can I do with that? In this person's interest, 
I can have a conversation with the customer and say, you know what? You don't need to make a commitment today, but I want to understand and help you. That very term, I want to help you, would send a different signal than I am pushing you to make this deal or sign on the dotted line. Hmm. But that's in my control. How I communicate is in my control. What is not in my control is the situation that the customer is in. It's potentially um, financial constraint or a dependency that we don't know of. There are many things that are not in our control. If, if I, as a salesperson, am going to try and control that uncontrollable, I'm going to be constantly disappointed and unsuccessful. But if I can True. control those things, I want to be able to plan. I want to list out what are my controllable variables? Can I now talk through this? I would still approach the coach. I want her to come to me and talk about, this is the situation. These are the things that are happening. I think these are the things I can do. There are things that are happening or could be happening that I don't know of. How do I address this? And that's a conversation that is so well thought out. And we now have some structure to that conversation rather than the first way that says, you know what, this customer is being very difficult. I can't deal with this. So. As a coach, I'm processing two things. I may be a boss, I may not be a boss, but let's say I am the boss. You know what? You gotta go get this done, right? I can also react. But you know what? Why do you think this is a problem? Everybody is doing it. I'm gonna start going to comparative nature because I don't have that much data, nor, do, nor have I been given a sense of structure to have this conversation with you. I could also react but let's talk about the second scenario. This is the woman's perspective. This is my perspective. As a coach, what I would do is, you know what, what's going on? Sit down, tell me about it. I would still lay down that structure for that salesperson. I have done this many a times for individuals where I, when somebody storms into my office or says, you know what, I need to talk with you. Do you have five minutes? It's usually the way things start. I'd like to say, okay, tell me what's going on. Okay, let's think about this in a structured manner. What is in your control? What is not in your control? Yeah, that's good. Half the time, I'd say more than half the time, when we take the uncontrollables out of the picture, they start feeling same. They start feeling like they can start building a response to the situation. That's, I think, more than 50% of the time the issue. We try to control things that we just don't have in our control. That's a cause for disappointment. such a simple framework and yet so rarely followed. And what I'm hearing from you is as a professional first, just figure out what is in my control, what is not in my control, um, solve for things which are in my control. And you're right, like the salesperson, it's very, what is in my control is how do I communicate in a way I help a customer achieve a certain objective versus just be frustrated about things which I cannot control, which is when will this person respond back? Will they close the deal? What's going to happen around it? Absolutely. Very amazing. And I love the way you put the manager's perspective also inside it. And a manager exactly needs to think, hey, what can I control in this situation? What can I not control? Let me not also get emotionally triggered and explode this situation even further. But let me help give strength to the individual so that they can become more in control of the situation. This is as much a coach's responsibility to be mature and be better as is an expectation from a coach for that person walking into the cabin. Hari, I have an observation that I'd love to ask you. You use the term coach versus manager, right? Or boss, or even, for example, leader, right? Help me understand this choice versus the other terms. This goes back to how we perceive Threat in some ways. I'm not a psychologist, so don't quote me or use me medically on any of these things. But I, this is from experience. And when I, my choice of words sends signals. And if I sit across the table as a manager or as a boss, the box that I confine that conversation into is about performance, is about rules, it's about governance. It's about a variety of things that are not feelings and emotions and perspective. Now, a coach is somebody who works with you, knows your limits, understand your, understands your limits, understands your constraints, understands your strengths, and finds ways to extend your strengths. In some cases, helps you overcome weaknesses. But the person who's going to work with you 
rather than want you to work for them. And I think a boss or a manager is somebody who wants you to work for them. I am inherently exercising superiority when I say that. As a coach, I'd like to be trusted. I'm not sure how many managers can be trusted. I don't know how to say it. Anymore. <laughs> As a coach, I want to be trusted. And if I can't earn the trust of the individual, I will not be able to unbox what's going on. Wow. wow. This is fantastic. So what I'm hearing from you is... As a coach, I shift my own mindset and I make my, my mindset as a one which is more enabling the person to be able to perform the tasks which are bigger than them. Whereas as a manager, I limit the person so that they can only perform only as much to a certain extent and then I take control or I am in control of the entire situation per se. Yes. Uh, one one is, is this a sense of threat to perform. Mm -hmm. The other one is an opportunity to excel. If I had to just paraphrase it. Threat to perform versus an opportunity to excel. I think far better stated than me and very, very well uh, said as well. Do you see a shift in organizations more towards versus being a manager, people need to be a coach? Or do you think it's just like a change of phrase? You know, manager is now the ugly word. So now let's use this new term called coach. How I don't is this think aspect going of away? I don't think they're going away. They exist. Mm -hmm. And managers are required, they have certain tasks and duties and responsibilities, accountability, whatever you may call it. Um, coaching is a culture, right? Coaching is less about um, a management term. Um, it's more a culture. We want to imbibe a coaching culture. I think organizations are going towards a coaching culture. I would say in the India geography, I have seen the rise of external coaches as well. Organizations that focus on external coaching, organizations and individuals that are uh, building a profession and a career around coaching, that's increased. If you, if you think about the history, many organizations, the family-owned businesses were built on hierarchy. They were built on superiority. They were built on individuals that they trusted in a close-knit circle. They groomed a few individuals too. There was some coaching culture, but it was more grooming them to become something that they were, not what they could become. In many organizations today, I am seeing the idea of coaching, external coaching, and the culture of internal coaching as well. I've been fortunate to be part of a firm that has coaching as a culture built within. It is not a management level. It is not a promotion level. It is not a change of designation. It is a culture. Today, even my junior most individual is a coach. To a peer, to an intern that comes in, he or she would be a coach to that intern. I am a coach to somebody who is a level below me, a level, few levels below me. I even coach my own peers, depending on the situation. And we can do that only when we don't see that as a management level. We see that as a culture of the organization. I can coach people who are about me. I coach my clients sometimes. The clients come to us. In some cases, we say clients pay our bills. And in the typical hierarchy, the clients are about us, the customers are about us. But I coach clients and I ask clients for coaching as well. That's more a culture, it's more a behavior that we embody within an organization. I, I certainly see a lot of organizations um, starting to value coaching beyond just a term that is used in the parlance of performance management. So coaching is a culture and as a culture, it gets embodied in a person and the way they think about every interaction. Like you very rightly mentioned, even the junior most employee in that sense is a coach to the intern who is joining into the organization. Absolutely. Right? Um, and it's a culture versus a level of hierarchy. That's absolutely right. It, 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 in, in a sports analogy, coach is not your boss, right? Coach, coach is not at the level, right? Correct. Matt Djokovic does not report to his um, Goran Ivan Sevich. Goran is his coach, Correct. but he doesn't report to him, right? Correct. They work as a mm. team, and that's where the whole behaviors and culture is coming. They work as a team, and that's where the entire coaching culture starts coming into play. Do you feel that coaching will go up with time? How do you see this changing the organization culture? Within the evolution of an organization, 
It is what the organization is going to embody and how they how they culturally evolve. I would say coaching is required for individuals to feel a sense of belonging with an organization. And it is upon the organization's belief system to give that sense of belonging to people. Today, if I right. was working for the defense, I don't think I feel a sense of belonging in the defense. I feel a sense of duty in the defense. And I have never been in the defense, but this is again drawing from parallels and experience and conversation. Um, we feel a sense of duty, responsibility in defense forces. You can have organizations that are built like the defense forces, regiment, discipline, duty bound. You don't get to say no to your commanding officer. That works in situations where you are on the war front. You just know you can't have time to think. Um, and I have situations in organizations where you are in the war room and you can't just be thinking about taking time to coach there. Yes, there are war room situations. But culturally, for an organization to sustain, give its employees and people a sense of belonging and want that employee to feel a sense of ownership to deliver the exact same outcomes and experience as its founder or super senior leaders would, you need to give that person that sense of, I am in this too. I am no different. I would do the same thing as you would. And I want to win this as much as you want to win. And I feel the sense of loss and the pain as much as you feel the loss. That doesn't come without the sense of belonging. That's rooted in coaching. This is something I coach people. I want you to feel that loss. I want you to feel the joy of the win. It's not my profit, it's yours too. And so that that is a coaching culture, in my opinion. I'll make a brief point about a second nature to this. This is, a, this is a bit of a byproduct and an outcome. If I make somebody a better individual, there's a good chance that my organization is going to grow to be substantially better than I started it out. It's exponential growth, it's exponential cultural advantage when I coach individuals to be coaches rather than coach individuals to be best performers only. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'd completely agree with you. And I think these are such powerful thoughts. And I do hope organizations that listen to it understand this shift between a manager and a coach and also work to build coaching as a culture in their own organizations. I have a personal take around this. And I think the Gen I's who are entering into the workforce will essentially not be looking for managers. They'll only be looking for coaches, people who enable them to excel in their own potential. I think that's the direction that pretty much all organizations will need to take. Absolutely. I, the current generation has also been, I'm going to say spoiled for choice as a phrase, but <laughs> theory of evolution, right? We, mm. I grew up with limited choices, with limited exposure. Uh, my father's generation probably grew up with even limited choices and exposure. But as generations progress, they've got a lot more exposure. They've got a lot more avenue for learning. And given they can learn so much on their own and it's free to consume in many which ways and it's ready to consume in many which ways, as individuals, as coaches, as organizations, it is our responsibility to give them an additional avenue for learning, an additional avenue for them to improve. If I look past... What I did, I don't think I went into uh, the equivalent of a Coursera or anything and say, you know what, I want to learn this today. And one month later, I'm certified in an area where I had no idea. I can do that on my own. I don't need organizations to just give me that structured training and certification. I need organizations to augment me with how do I now present myself? How do I now carry myself? How do I now uh, react to situations? How do I now respond to difficult conversation. So I am also the coach in a, in a particular setting that is entitled handling difficult conversations. And I've got 15 slides to go through, but I rarely go through the 15 slides because it's a framework. You can use it, but more often what they are listening to is my experience. How did I handle a difficult conversation? And then they throw out questions to me. Here's a difficult situation I have. Help me handle this. And if a fourth person tells me, here's a difficult situation, help me handle this. I don't think the two situations or the four situations are the same. 
it depends on the context it depends on the situation it depends on the individual the the, the background so many things matter so we can't train for this we can't teach this this is coaching and individuals coming in in the new generation don't have a complete appreciation for this but they sought that they seek that appreciation because everything is instantly available right now this okay. ability for you to navigate difficult situations and differential situations are not going to be because i flipped a switch it's because you went through this over time and you fine tuned yourself correct that is the coaching that we have to in deliver as organizations so they can be better placed for the future in my opinion very fair opinion very fair opinion hari i'm going to move you from this conversation to your own career journey and one of the things our listeners find a lot of value in is knowing how you evolved yourself from a young professional to the role that you are in now uh, help us understand you your journey a little better sure. i've had a very fruitful career um you're saying the journey is not over it's still a journey we don't know where it's going to go but early on i said i've had multiple careers in this organization that i have been in i started out a completely small uh, internship like role in india but my career took me to i got my mba in the us i i started with a large professional services firm where i started has nothing to do with what i'm doing today so that's the headline but i do break up my journey into sort of four eras if you will um is that era era 1 era 1.5 i look at era 1 it was more jumping into an area where i had absolutely no idea what i was getting into i was coming fresh out of business school and um all it what it may but business school and corporate world has a giant valley in the middle it's not like i have mba and i have everything to go and deliver um ceo value right? it's it's um, every business school student i have spoken to i've had to bring them down to earth and say you're not going to go meet with the cio or the ceo when you join us you know how to learn the ropes right and that's where i was when i started as well and so when i started it was era 1.0 which was be humble take whatever comes at you um and say yes quite a lot and i don't know if i did that because i was deliberately doing it or because it just so happened but i was saying yes a lot and saying yes meant opportunities came my way and that was sort of step 0 if you will right that's why i call that era 1 i said yes to a lot of things i took a lot of things that came my way but that leads me to era 1.5 which is like how do i deliver on this that's learning so that's saying yes to a lot of things being humbled by the the opportunities that came my way and learning whatever came at me what i knew was i'm going to have to spend that extra time if i had somebody next to me that knew it all and i knew nothing and we were doing the same thing i knew i had to spend more time and that was the learning part of it So that's era 1 1.5. Era 2 was when new challenges came by. So I was an expert in an area for four years and something else came by and I was told I had to do this. But you know what? If you want to get anywhere and if you want to start there was a slight organizational change and I had a choice between staying where I was versus being thrown into something I didn't want to go to. So I was told if I want to stay where I am here's what you need to do. I said okay I'm up for it. Let's do it. And they threw me into an area where I had no experience. In. Three years later, I was the tech sector's expert in doing that project. I had no, absolutely no idea to do that. So that's era 2.0, which is being thrown into the deep end of the pool and keeping your neck above water. Right? That's what I was. My coach back then told me that, Hari, I want to be able to say that I threw you in the deep end of the pool and you kept your neck <laughs> above water. Right? That's the way he characterized performance for me. I don't know if I was frightened by that. I was motivated by that. I think I was motivated by that. And so that was era 2.0 then three new challenges came by I took on everything everything was new every time I took it so one thing that strung all of this together in my journey was a saying yes and b new challenges principally new challenges helped me do what I was doing and and don't get me wrong it was not all me right I had great coaches along the way like this one person who told me about keeping the neck above water that person also gave me the resources gave me his ear gave me knowledge allowed me the time and it is important for all of us to be given the right resources and time to excel it's not just giving the opportunities 
but I want the confidence of that coach to tell me, I think you have it, you've got it. What resources do you need? I'll give it to you. And that's that's what led me to believe that coaching is a real thing that can help you be successful and find things that you're successful in, address the weaknesses or get somebody else to fill the weaknesses that you have. And the last thing was when I, uh, the, sort of the era of 3, 3.54, to say that because three was when I was given this opportunity to move to India. Um, I say, I call this an opportunity because of what I am today, but back then I was asked to move. And I said, yes, again, being who I am, I said, yes, I completely uprooted my family, my six year old, my three month old in tow. We came to India, we were to set up a large organization um, in India that was never done before. By the time, nobody ever did it. And the motivational point, the same coach told me back then was, Ari, this is the stuff that partners are asked to do. I wasn't a partner or, an, or a managing director back then. He said, this is the kind of stuff that we ask partners to do. This is big stuff, right? And so it's a sense of motivation that I am being told to do something huge for the firm, in terms of impact, purpose. I took that up. It was to stabilize the ship in India. It was to grow this organization many fold. I did that. And then this last era came by, which is, you know what? Now that you've done this, we want you to do this for another organization within the firm, another organization. And what I'm doing now has nothing to do with where I started, even in India, except one thing, which is people are at the helm of our success. People are at the core of our success. And people look up to you for being a voice. People look up to you for being a motivational factor. And people look up to you for being better. And I think I have found my purpose in being that coach when people say, you know what, I have a problem. Or you know what, I want to listen to you. That is a sense of purpose and impact that I've had uh, in a career. Whether I continue where I am or go anywhere else, I think that's a string that I want to take with me in my journey. And I found that really, really uh, a factor that's bound me to where I am and rooted to what I do. Wow. wow. So my takeaways were, A, at the earlier part of your career, be comfortable saying yes a lot more. That's what you should be doing. And then make sure you have the right intent. You go at it with all the help and support that you can get. Uh, you'll be lucky you get resources. If not, ask for the right resources from the right coaches and you'll most probably get them. And then just keep moving that journey forward for yourself. That's right. Absolutely right. right. It's and one you thing get to the other thing. Yeah. It, one thing will just keep leading to the other thing. And you will get assignments which will suddenly perhaps stretch you to the next level. And that's the place where you keep your calm and stretch yourself to be able to deliver that next uh, role. And then the next one. And then the next one. Wow. You are like that rubber band that just keeps on stretching itself longer and longer. Huh? I would probably come across people who will say, oh my God, this is enough. I have done enough. Um, I need to rest now. I don't see that coming from you at all. Not there yet. Because Not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm always also very curious about this work and this drive for work and the personal life. How did your family take the move from San Jose, for example, to India? Um, how did all of those elements get factored in? I, I'm fortunate. My wife has been very understanding. And um, hmm. throughout our, we've been married a little over 16 years, and I'm going to count. And if she hears I'm counting, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> but we've been married for over 16 years right now. And uh, I've been with this kind of a job for as long as she, is, uh, she and I have been married. We've known each other before that. But I'll tell you that keeping your family aware um, of what we are doing, what I'm doing, this is important. Right from the beginning, keeping my family aware of what I'm doing, the kind of work I do, um, times are not always unshkar based. Um, in consulting, I do what my client needs, when the client needs, which meant there were times that I was never back home at the night. In the early part of my career, going hand in hand with a yes mantra, I wasn't back home in the night sometimes. And I would stretch, stretch, stretch. Yes. Am I saying that's the best um, culture? No. But there are times where we are, like you said, we gotta. it's like a peak and valley. You have to be able to go to your peak, find your valleys, 
recover, go back to the peaks. It's like the game of tennis. By the way, I play tennis, so a lot of my analogies are also tennis-based in many ways. I've got to find my peak and go to my trough and come back again. Um, the move, um, we had our kids in the U.S. The move was not easy. As much as I was born in India, raised in India, we rooted ourselves in the U.S., in the U.S. ways of doing things for a very long time. We had bought a house there. We'd done a lot of things that were very, very, um, very American style centric. But we also deep down knew that if an opportunity came by and if this were to happen, we'd think about it. Right? But it came by when we were not necessarily fully ready for it. Uh, and it was one of those things where, you know what, if we don't jump into it, we will never know what that's going to feel like. We just have to jump into it. Do we have some of our braces in place? Do we have some of our cushions in place? Do we feel confident about the facts surrounding us? Let's just take the leap of faith. That's that's the way it started. It was rough. The family, um, the kids, my daughter was only three months old when we came to India. My son was five years old. Uh, we went through a lot of typical health-related issues settling in. Uh, the, new, uh, the new normal had to set in. But the idea of having... A, a professional ecosystem helped. For my wife, it was a family. For me, it was her and my family. We don't have family in, in Bangalore. We were both raised in Chennai, so family is was in Chennai back then. But Bangalore was an equilibrium in terms of many cultural aspects from where I came from in the Silicon Valley to here. Mm. But that said, it was, um, it was rough in many which ways, conversations. I think the firm helped me where I worked helped me. There again, coaching and the culture that the firm invited in me helped. This goes a long way. I've, I've helped people move from the US after that myself in my firm. And so a lot of them give me a call and say, look, how is it for you to go, go through this? What did you have to go through? And I say, the reality is you go through shit, right? <laughs> so pardon me for that. You go through difficult times. You do go through difficult times. You have to acknowledge that. But you also have to acknowledge that you're going to need to find certain um, positive things for you to get you through. Here, it was a game of tennis, access to tennis courts and finding the time to do that. A certain sense of flexibility set in for me. For my wife, it was being able to call her mother sometimes during the daytime and having them come in and uh, spend a weekend, a we going to their place and spend a weekend rather than you know, this giant plan of parents coming to the US and spending three months because they did the 24 hour travel one way and they have to see the world in the US. There was no pressure. That pressure was lifted off. So it was easy to go back and forth and literally make those visits from a family point of view. From a professional point of view, uh, leaning back and continuing to have coaches in the firm, continuing to have voices in the firm that say, you know what, you're in the right place. For me to have been successful in what I'm doing, I needed, I needed people, sponsors in my organization that said, you're doing the right thing, I'll get you what you want. And I think I set that up. So setting up your guardrails and making sure your sponsors are aligned to what you're doing, getting advocates in the organization was very, very important. I was not the best marketing agent for myself, but I had to learn that. I had people tell me how I needed to present myself, how I needed to say certain things, ask for certain things. So I think professionally that went a long way when I had advocates lined up, when I had people to back me up in my decisions. When things were not going well, I had already told some people that you could see certain issues and you need to back me up. Rather than being blindsided by things and trying things on your own, going it together helped. Whether it was personal or professional, going it together was really a huge help in, in seeing through every day's successes and failures. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this. And it's such a few messages that I take away, right? The first one that I've taken away from you is it's very important to make sure that your partner is in on with your game. Uh, they understand what you're doing. They understand why you're doing what you're doing and what makes it important to you so that it become, they become an ally in the journey versus think of that as a competition to right. the time that you have with them, right? So it's that is one part of it. And that communication is dependent on you, the professional versus... Imagining that the other person will understand it themselves. Right. Yeah, the and last second, thing we want to do is make assumptions and then completely go wrong. Yeah. So it doesn't help both ways. So communication is a huge part of it. 
communication with your partner. And then the next thing you also mentioned is communication with the ecosystem that you're around. Um, your uh, internal coaches, your family members, everybody contributes. And in that sense, they strengthen you to be able to take on the challenges and uh, pursue the journey that you're on. Yes. Fair. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, glass ceiling is a very interesting area that hits a lot of professionals as well. Whether it is just disillusion with itself, whether it is not finding the breaks, whether it's seeing somebody else move faster than you, where you feel you have the right to be promoted. How is that for you, Hari? Did you experience glass ceilings? What did you do? I would say yes, in short. And I will say no, elaborate. And the reason I say yes in short is it's a point in time feeling. The idea of a glass ceiling, in many cases it is real. Let's say we, some organizations do have those uh, situational issues. In my case, it was a point in time feeling. And I said no, and I will elaborate on that. I'll tell you why. Uh, having spent 18 years of my career in one firm, some would say you've been there too long. Some would say, wow, that's enriching. Uh, and it's a it's a point of view. In my case, I'd say I've had to learn what my journey has been. And it is not without experience and not without these situations of having experienced a glass ceiling that I come out and say, my journey has been fruitful, has been refreshing, it's been my own. To compare myself with my friends, my peers, my other colleagues that may have started a career with me is futile because Chances are I got things along the way that was specific to me and I am where I am because of where I wanted to go. I hmm. had many controllables in that respect. The second thing I would say is um, along the way, I have had situations where I've been passed up for a promotion. I have been passed up for a promotion. Sometimes it's things I control because I uh, made some choices and sometimes it's because, look, you are just not in the business area that is growing the way you are growing. Is that your mistake? No. Is that anybody else's mistake? No. It's just nature in some ways, right? It's just that you're in a situation. I can't go back in time and tell somebody, you should not have joined Lehman Brothers in 2007. I didn't know enough Lehman Brothers. I will tell you at one time when I was doing my MBA, I was telling my friends, maybe I'll go join Lehman Brothers, right? Thank God I did not join Lehman Brothers for what happened to them. But... It's information and facts that you have that you use to process certain things and progress on your journey. You make decisions. I made decisions along the way. My move to India was questioned. Like, are you sure this is the right time for you to move? You were on a certain track that you would have gotten to um, being an MD slash partner in the firm sooner. I said, there was no better time for me to do what I'm doing. Not everything is just my career related to. There was many more factors that played into it. Now. Did that push my ability to make it to the level I am in by two years? Yes, it did. But do I feel I have gained so much more a sense of purpose, so much more of leadership quotient than I would have ever gained had I continued doing what I was doing in the US? Absolutely, yes. I would not have had the opportunity to do what I have done in the last six years. I'd go all out and say some people in my peer set probably still don't have the opportunity to have do what I did. And I cannot, I don't want to trade that for anything. But to your question, I got passed up on going up the level for two years because of that. Because I made some choices. I made some choices. In the industry, we talk about people making lateral moves or horizontal moves and career changes and whatnot. But there's a reason they do it. Because there's, there's only so much you can ask for when you are making some decisions that you understand are going to impact your progress in a certain way that you'd imagine. And so that's, in my essence, my journey. I wouldn't, for anybody that's starting out their career, I often tell them, you may go faster than your classmate, you may go slower, but you're going to have to keep your eyes on what you want to do and get out of it. You may get it sooner or later, but did you get what you wanted to get out of it? Not everything is the exact same journey. And middle management is sort of a chasm, if you will. The juniors sort of get it, but then you have to remind them in middle management, right? It's This, again, is a situation where, you know, oh, this person got promoted to manager. I did not. Why did he do so many things? Why didn't I 
get to do these things. Explaining that can only go so far. Self introspection of what I really got out of this and now where do I want to go with it goes much farther. That's my story. It's a very beautiful story. And what I'm hearing from you is know what your end pace is, know what you are going for. And continue moving in that journey. There will be ups, there will be downs, and you will experience life in its infinite uh, variations. But as long as a person knows what he wants to do and where he or she wants to get to, don't get bothered by other distractions that will keep happening your way. Um, and what I'm also gathering from you is a lot of professionals will have their own opinions. Maybe a lot of well-wishers will have their opinions on what you should and what you should not be doing. And perhaps all of them are right, but at the end of the day, You've got to take a step back. You've got to take a call for yourself, which also ties to the first point you brought out in this podcast, which is, hey, think before you start getting into something. Think for your own self what you really want and then get inside things. Absolutely. It's a, if you ever draw analogy there, Vivek, it is like driving in Bangalore traffic, right? <laughs> There's so many variables. You've got autos, you've got speed bumps. Speed bumps of different sizes. You've got auto rickshaws, two wheelers, buses. Like, are you going to be just getting into the car and driving straight? No. Your destination is sort of there, but the route you take and the, the amount of pauses you make is going to be based on what you encounter. So that's that's the way I would see it. Absolutely brilliant. I think nobody can put this better as the Bangalore traffic and logic can. But you're right, uh, completely hear you on that one. Um, Hari, we spent almost 40 minutes. I have to share this is twice the time that normally we'd take. Um, and thank you for such inspiring and very evolved uh, thoughts into everything that you are putting forward in for our listeners. So thank you so much for this one. Thank you. I have one final question for you, sure. which is your advice. And I'm going to split it into three parts. Your advice to people who are starting their careers, young professionals, to people who are at the middle layer and then middle layer, but trying to get onto a C-suite position, right? Uh, so mid-senior to senior, what would your advice be to these three layers? Um, there's a couple of different things. And the first thing I'm going to say, it, it doesn't matter whether you're getting your career started or whether you're a mid-level or you're a senior management integrity is an often uh, understated principle and we are constantly checked for our integrity we're constantly judged for our integrity it matters more as we go up to the senior levels because we are in front of thousands of our people that are looking up to us for genuine honest perspectives and I'd say that every single time that I have a conversation or I think about executing an action, I want to think that I don't, I would have thought through this. I would have said the most honest thing that I can ever say. And a simple example with my kids, I'd say, uh, and, and growing up, my kids, I say, look, if you should own your mistakes, I would rather that you say the truth and face the consequences rather than telling something that's not the truth or half truth then continuing to have to cover that up and finding a new excuse, finding a new explanation. It's far easier to just say the truth and face the consequences. And let's, we are, we are invariably, we are rewarded for being genuine and being honest. That's number one, and that applies to everybody. Uh, for somebody that's starting out their career, I would say uh, know your audience. So know the people. You're also speaking to a lot of different types of people. And we have to change and adapt and be agile to the way we are communicating. My classic example is, and this invariably happens to middle managers, but I will tell you, the practice starts young. The practice starts early. When I get middle managers in a conference room and they are presenting to a group full of people, they are the best prepared presenters greatly prepared. What they fail to understand is they are prepared to deliver what they wanted to deliver, not what their audience really wanted to hear. At least not all the time. And things change. Right? You go into a presentation room and they're posing questions to you. They stop you. They say, you know what? I don't want to hear about this. I want something else. You want to change and be agile. Listen. 
it, it's defined by listen a little bit. We are too prepared to give advice and solve problems, but we are not too prepared to listen and now contextualize our response a little different. That's number two. And number three is simply being aware of the outcomes and aware of how you are going to be impacting an individual or an outcome, if you will. Actions speak loud. And in a team, in a situation, we have to be cognizant and respectful of individual differences. Um, in the thirst and the hunger to run really, really fast as a junior resource, don't lose sight of the people next to you. As a middle manager, you're going to have to take people along with you. So communicating that people is important. And you're going to have to keep your senior management abreast of everything that's happening. So that you need them to be your advocates rather than your bosses who are questioning you. In the middle management, you really want to be able to take them along. And I, I, I sort of close this question with one thought, right? If I can attribute my success to being in the position that I am in today, it's because people push me up. I spent less effort pulling myself up. Pull-ups are always harder unless there's somebody spotting you from the bottom. I want people spotting you from the bottom and you can always go up the ladder and be respected and admired only if you continue to have people that are pushing you. That's really important. Fantastic. So integrity, listen, don't just go there to deliver your message mm -hmm. and have people to spot you, people who will push you up to greater and greater heights Thank and you. that helps you create a great career. Hari, any last thoughts that you may have? Any parting shots that you'd like to give? Um, I wouldn't call these parting thoughts, Vivek, but uh, I'd say this conversation has also helped me think through a few things. Uh, quite often, I, uh, I tell myself, I don't run coaching conversations because somebody wants to listen to me. I also want to introspect with it. And I want to get something out of these conversations myself. So anytime you are in a coaching conversation or you are talking to somebody about coaching, think about what you're going to get out of this too. Right? Um, today, for me, this was about introspecting how I feel about sharing my thoughts. How I feel, am I genuine about sharing my thoughts? I don't want to leave this conversation today and be a completely different, different person. So I came into this thinking I want to be genuine. I am walking out of this feeling and think I did the right thing. Those are my parting thoughts, and I, I'd love for principles to be validated. I'd love for be, people to hear what I went through personally. Excellent. For your thoughts and time, Hari, thank you so much. It's been a delightful conversation with you today. Loved hearing you, your journey, and the drive that you bring along with you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me here today.